from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings, the 18th chapter. 1 Kings, the 18th chapter in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 18. And this is one of the most dramatic stories in all the Bible. 1821. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal be God, follow him. And the people answered, not a word. Elijah is the most remarkable character to me in all the Old Testament. I like to read about him. He's mentioned 30 times in the New Testament, and when Jesus Christ went to the Mount of Transfiguration, there were two men that were there with him, Elijah and Moses. So we know that hundreds of years after Elijah had died or had been taken to heaven, we know that he came back. And we know that he was living and he was talking because he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. But here in his life story, he suddenly appears at the darkest moment of Israel's history. Never had the nation gone so low morally, spiritually, militarily, economically, as it was at this hour. The nation was struggling for its very existence, and out of nowhere there came this rugged, strong, craggy, young, long-haired, sun-tanned son of the desert, Elijah, and he suddenly announced to the people, Elijah is here. And the king trembled on his throne because Elijah came in the power and the anointing of the Spirit of God. It used to be said that Mary, Queen of Scots, was more afraid of the prayers of John Knox, one preacher, than she was all the armies of England. One man and God constitute a majority anywhere. Elijah was a mighty prophet of the Lord. And what had happened in Israel that had caused Israel to go down so rapidly was that a very wicked man had come to the throne. His name was Ahab. And the Bible says that he did more evil than any other king that had ever preceded him. And then he did something else. He married a woman from one of the heathen nations, which was against ancient Israeli law. He married Jezebel, and she worshipped Baal. She didn't believe in God. She didn't believe in the God of ancient Israel. She didn't believe in the God of Moses. She didn't believe in the God of Abraham. She believed in Baal. And Baal was one of the worst forms of worship that we've ever known. Filled with sensuality, sex orgies, human sacrifice, and all the rest. And this is a very interesting thing, that in a time when people turn away from the true God, many times you'll find that they will put sex violence, and their religion together. And we're seeing indications of that in America with the rise of Satan worship and their cults, the emphasis on sex, the emphasis on violence. Put them together and you have something the Bible says that God abhors and God will judge and the wrath of God will fall upon that people. And that was the situation when Elijah appeared on the scene. And the first thing Elijah did was to protest, except Elijah was almost alone. He thought he was alone. But God had told him later that there were 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. And Elijah said to the king, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather all the prophets of Baal that believe in idolatry and lead idolatry in this country. I want you to gather them at Mount Carmel that looks out over the Mediterranean Sea. And I'll come up there and we'll let all the people come and watch and we'll have a contest. I will debate 
the 450 prophets of Baal publicly and let the people decide who is God. And the king said, all right. So all the people gathered, thousands of people gathered on Mount Carmel and the 400 prophets of Baal. And Elijah was standing for God alone. He was just one man, one solitary prophet standing there all by himself. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get two bulls, build two altars. You call on your God, Baal. I'll call on my God, the true and the living God, and we'll see who answers by fire. They said, all right. So they built their altar. They cut their bull, bullock up, laid it on the altar, thousands of people watching, and then they began to call on Baal. They said, oh, Baal, 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 answer by fire. We know you're the true God. Nothing happened. And Elijah stood there and laughed at it. And it's one of the most humorous things in all the Bible. He said, go ahead, yell. Maybe your God's on a trip somewhere. <laughs> and from morning till noon, they screamed and they yelled and they cried and they prayed and then they began to cut themselves until blood was gushing out all over the place, trying to get Baal to answer. But of course, Baal couldn't answer. Then Elijah said, all right, it's time for me to take over. He said, all right, build the altar. And they built the altar, put the bullock on the altar. He said, now I want you to get 12 barrels of water and pour it on top. Dig a trench around it, fill that with water, and everything is soaking wet. Then Elijah called upon God. And the fire came down from heaven and burned up the bullock and burned up the altar, burned up the whole thing. And the people said, we believe in the Lord God who is answered by fire. And Elijah won the day and left Mount Carmel victorious over the false prophets of Baal. I want you to notice who was there. Three groups of people. One group one man, Elijah. So on the other side, 450 prophets of Baal, all experts in religion, philosophy, and psychology. And, on the, and out in between were the vast mass of people who were not sure. They were uncommitted. They were not sure whether Baal was God. They were not sure whether Elijah's God was God. Their ancient, ancient traditions made them want to believe in Jehovah. Their interest, though, was in pleasing the king and being relevant and being in. They didn't want to be old-fashioned and traditionalist and out of step. They didn't want to be caught believing in the Ten Commandments if that wasn't the end thing. You see, men have always been sort of faddist. We go after fads. That's true in every generation. And the end thing at that moment was to believe in Baal with all the freedom of sex and sensuality and the orgies. Now, they didn't like the human sacrifice, but all religion demands some sort of sacrifice, so what they would do, they'd take their babies, many times a chosen baby, and put in the hands of this great God and the baby would be burned up and they'd give their babies as human sacrifices. That was Baal worship. But then there were many who were secret followers of the true God. They didn't believe all that hocus pocus about Baal. They had a guilty feeling about it, but they were afraid. They were afraid of standing up for God, afraid of standing up for what they believed to be truth. And so they didn't take a stand publicly. You see, Jesus demands a public stand. That's why I ask people to come forward. He demands a public stand. You can't be a secret follower of Jesus and please him. 
He said, if you're not willing to take your stand publicly and openly, I'll not take my stand openly for you in heaven. And without the intercession of Jesus Christ, none of us would ever make it. And then Elijah said something to all these people. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. He said, make a decision. God's not going to allow you to have an altar to Baal in your home, to materialism in your home, and then go to church on Sunday and think that's going to do it. You've got to come all out for Jesus Christ. He must be first and Lord in every area of your life if you're to be acceptable to God. Now, the people had seen the evidence. They knew Baal couldn't give them peace and joy and happiness. They knew that. You know, one of our most famous film stars said the other day this. I won't call her name, but she was quoted in one of the magazines as saying this. I was the victim of the American dream. I'd been brought up to believe that when I found success, I would automatically be terribly happy. We were all taught that. Well, I got the success. I'd spent 21 years believing that as soon as all these wonderful things happened to me, my troubles would vanish. Well, they didn't. It, it was a big disillusionment, she said. And she's only 21 now. 21 years! thinking that if she made it on television, and she's famous on television, and she's famous in motion pictures around the world, that she'd be happy. She said, it's been a big disillusion. You see, Baal can't bring inner peace and satisfaction to the human heart. Pascal once said it, the great scientist. He said, happiness is neither within or without us. It is in God. And only when God is in us is happiness within us and without us. How true that is. Happiness and peace and joy come in knowing God. Baal couldn't answer their deepest needs, their great philosophical questions of where did I come from, why am I here, where am I going. Baal gave them no answers. Neither does capitalism and materialism and secularism and humanism. It's found only in a relationship with God. You see, you were made for God, made in God's image, made for fellowship with God, and you can try all your life in a thousand different directions to find that certain something, and you'll never find it. I've seen men strive to become the most brilliant scientist, and I know some of the most brilliant scientists in America that are miserable. I've seen men spend their lifetime making money, and I know some of the richest men in America, and I know how miserable some of them are. I've seen men strive all their lives to attain political power, and they get political power. They get the office they were seeking, but it doesn't bring the peace and the joy and the happiness and the fulfillment they thought it would. But here's an interesting thing. I've never seen a person give their lives to Jesus Christ sincerely, but what they didn't find, what they were looking for. He satisfies the deepest longings of our hearts and our lives. Now, Elijah taught us one thing, and Jesus teaches it too. You must make a choice. You have a will of your own, and you have to decide. How long will you halt between two opinions? Jesus said there are two ways of life. Now, the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Some of you think you're all right and that you're on the right road now. You don't realize that you're on the broad road that leads to destruction. Jesus said there are two roads, the broad road and the narrow road. The narrow road leads to eternal life. The broad road leads to destruction. And every person in this audience tonight is on one or the other. Which are you on? He said there are two masters. He said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You'll either hate one and love the other or love one and hate the other. He said, make a choice. He said, there are two fathers. You know, the Bible doesn't teach the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, not in the sense that many people teach it. By creation, he's our father. By creation, we're all members of the same human race. 
And that's why we're to love each other no matter what race we come from. We're all brothers in that sense. But spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, we are not all of the same father and all of the same blood. There are only two groups, those who are lost and those who are saved, those on the broad road, those on the narrow road. You must be on one or the other. And there are two destinies. There is a heaven and there is a hell. I know it's not popular today to believe in hell. You can believe in heaven, but people would rather not think about hell. I don't blame you. It's a terrible place. But the Bible teaches it's going to be a hell. There is a hell where men are going to be separated from God forever. And there's a heaven where men are going to fellowship with each other and fellowship with Christ forever. You must make a choice. You young people, you have to make the choice. This is one choice you can't depend on your parents to make for you. Your parents can teach you and help you and do their best. And many of you parents have done your best with your children. You've prayed for them, you've loved them. But there comes a time when they have to make their own choice about Jesus Christ. They have to decide for themselves in the lonely arena of their own hearts. The greatest battle that's ever fought is this battle in the heart of a young person about Jesus Christ. And this is one thing you can't depend on anybody to make for you. You have the ability to make it. You have the right to make it. You can say yes or you can say no. It's one or the other. And Jesus does not allow neutral ground. And he warns against waiting too long. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. Come while you can. Don't put it off any longer. How long halt you between two opinions? Now, when you make that choice, there's going to be a price to be paid. The people that choose Jesus Christ will pay a price. There are thousands of people in other parts of the world. The price they have to pay is they're ostracized from their family. In some parts of the world, they can never go any further than grammar school if they make a decision for Christ. They can never get a job above menial labor if they make a decision for Christ. But in those parts of the world, thousands upon thousands are living for Jesus Christ. In America, we've had sort of an unnatural situation. It's almost popular to follow Christ in some areas of the country now. That won't last long. There's always a price. And if you receive Christ as your Savior and try to live for him, some people are going to sneer and they're going to make fun behind your back. And in this period of conformity, we don't want to be considered too different. But he calls upon you to be different. When the gang is doing certain things you know to be wrong, you take your stand and say, no, I can't do that because I'm a Christian, because I believe in Jesus Christ. It costs something to follow Christ. And Jesus said, you better sit down and count the cost one day. You see, a big crowd was following Jesus, and he said, wait a minute, count the cost. Do you know that I'm going to die on a cross, and if you follow me, you're going to have to go die with me? Oh, we didn't know that, Jesus. We thought you were setting up a big kingdom. We were going to be in the kingdom with you. So they left him. They will, there will be the cross for you to bear before the crown. And when you do come to Jesus Christ, you're going to be tested by God. God never has anyone come to him that he doesn't test you. Some of you have made your decisions for Christ this week, and already you're being tested. Temptation is coming. A friend doesn't understand the step that you've taken. Already you're filled with some doubts and weakness. This is all normal to every person that ever came to Christ. We don't start, just jump right out and be full grown. 
Grady Wilson, just, his daughter just had twins. Well, they weren't born full grown. One of them was five pounds and one was six pounds, and they're just little tiny babies. But they will be full grown someday. But it takes time to grow. God will test you when you come to Christ. And he demands an immediate decision. I wonder how many more sermons it would take to win you to Christ. How many more warnings will God have to give you? How, how many more graves will have to be dug? How many more wars will have to be fought? How many more earthquakes or tornadoes and floods will have to come before you make your decision? The thief on the cross took that one moment and said, Lord, remember me. And in that moment, Jesus said, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. That quick, you can make your decision and commitment. And remember, God loves you. He has a plan for your life. You're sinful. You're separated from God by sin. And some of the results of this sin are worry and irritability and lack of purpose in life, as well as some of the gross, immoral sins that we read about. God has provided the cross as a means for you to be forgiven of sin, but you must individually receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. You and you alone in the quiet arena of your heart will have to make that decision. How long? Will you halt between two opinions? Charlotte Elliott was a beautiful woman. And a great preacher by the name of Caesar Milan went all over Switzerland. He was put out of his church because of his faith. But once he was in England and he met this beautiful, charming young woman by the name of Charlotte Elliott. She was suffering ill health. And he went up to her and asked her if she would become a Christian. And she rebuked him and said, I resent you asking me that. And she was very irritated at him. He said, I didn't mean to be offensive to you, but I only meant to tell you that God loves you and God's willing to change your life and give you peace in your heart. That night, Charlotte Elliott could not sleep. The words that the preacher spoke to her kept ringing in her ears. And during the night, she got up, got on her knees, gave her life to Christ, and she sat down and wrote the hymn that we sing every night. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as you are. You don't have to go home and change clothes. You don't have to go home and get better. You can't improve yourself. You come just like you are with all your sins, with all your failures, with all your mistakes, with all your hypocrisy. You come just as you are. He will forgive you and change you and come into your life. And I'm going to ask you to do just that publicly and openly right now. I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat from all over this stadium and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I do receive Christ. You may be a member of the church, you might have thought that you were right with God before, but somehow you know you're not. You're not sure. You're not certain, but you'd like to be. I'm going to ask you to come right now. From up in the top galleries, it'll take a minute or two to come, but we're going to wait. Hundreds of people have come every night. You come. This is your moment and your hour of commitment. And after you've all come and stand here quietly, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. And if you're with friends or relatives or you've come in a bus, they'll wait on you. But you get up and come right now and make your commitment to Christ. We're going to wait. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision.
you that are watching by television, you can make your commitment right now in your home or wherever you happen to be watching. Hundreds of people here at the University of Kentucky Coliseum are coming to Jesus Christ. They're choosing between these two opinions. They're choosing Christ. They're coming just as they are. You can come just as you are where you are. May God help you to make that commitment tonight. God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I want to speak tonight on the home. In the 11th Psalm, there's a familiar passage that many of you know. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, and the foundation of any society is the home. And then a verse that goes with it, 82nd, Psalm, these words, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the world are out of course. Doesn't that sound like our day? All the foundations of the earth are out of course, and we're walking in darkness. We're stumbling. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, and he could bring light. Now, there's someone that has... I've had the privilege of sharing a home with for 42 years. She's the mother of our five children. She's the grandmother of our 16 grandchildren. She's on the platform. She could not be here most of Mission England last summer because she's been in and out of the hospital. Nothing terribly serious except uh, she had to have a new hip put in and she had to have an operation on her esophagus because uh, well, several years ago, she was fixing a swing for the grandchildren and she fell out of a tree and broke a number of bones and disoriented her insides. And she's now well for the first time in a long time. And uh, she coughs still a little bit. And I've asked her if she'll say a word. And she's a little bit nervous that she might cough. And if she does, just wait. She's got something more to say after that. So uh, I'm going to ask Ruth to come. People, people many, many reporters ask me, who is the greatest Christian I've ever known? I always answer, Ruth. She is the greatest Christian I've ever known. No, but happy, caring Christians have been a part of my heritage. In 1916, my parents landed in, in Shanghai, China, and spent the next 25 years of their li lives 
serving the people of China as medical missionaries. It wasn't easy. Those were troubled times with wars, disease, bandits, floods, and famine. And yet, because of them, we never knew what fear was. Daily in the home, there were family prayers with hymns and scripture reading and prayer. We were lovingly disciplined. We were t carefully trained. But not only did mother and daddy teach the Christian faith in the home, they lived it. And as a consequence, it was easy as a child to give my heart to the Lord Jesus. Later, they came to the States and we had the joy of living beside them for the last 25 years of their lives. And because of their Christian example, our five children were tremendously influenced. And due in a good part to them, they too gave their hearts to the Lord Jesus. I remember the last year of his life, Daddy was elected moderator of our church. Now he wasn't well at that time himself, and my mother had had a stroke and was in a wheelchair. But one morning I went down to check on them and Daddy was on his knees in front of Mother helping her put on her stockings. And he glanced up at me over his glasses and he said, you know, these are the greatest years of our lives. Caring for your mother has been the greatest privilege of my life. And the thing was, he really meant it. And so I thank God tonight for a Christian home and for what it has meant to me, to our children, and if you haven't had a Christian home, you can give your children a Christian home. And if your children have already grown up and left home, you can recommit your life to Christ and look around for some other young person to help. God bless you tonight. Thank you. That's the first time she's spoken in public in at least a year or 18 months, and I'm very <laughs> thankful. I think all of us are aware that something is wrong with our homes. Now, someone has said that all weddings are happy. It's the living together afterward that causes all the trouble. And there's some truth to that. An American psychologist says, marriage is a quiet hell for about half of all American couples. Now, what is wrong? Can the tide be reversed? Because the same could be said perhaps about the United Kingdom or the Ireland, wherever people are watching or listening. And I want to ask you this question on the scripture that we read. Is your home built on a solid foundation? Is it when floods of sorrow come, or the waves of temptation, or the gales of adversity, of war, death, or judgment strike? Will your home stand? Is the foundation strong? Social researchers are finding that in times of stress, rather than bringing families together, many marriage partners find it easier to flee from the struggle with the overwhelming emotions that family tragedies generate. One of our most famous families got involved in a terrible tragedy a few years ago. Their daughter was kidnapped, and they stuck together, and they prayed together, and they worked together, and they paid out thousands of dollars, and finally, she was rescued after about a year or two. But soon after she came home, they divorced. The emotions, the stress, the strain was too great, and that family broke up. Now, the Apostle Paul was ministering in Corinth, which was a hedonistic city, a pagan city, an immoral city. And he said this, he said, let every man take heed how he builds. For other foundation can no man build except that which is in Jesus Christ. If you build your home on Jesus Christ, 
the problems of the home are going to be far lessened and the problems of divorce may never come. We have found in a survey in the United States that where there's Bible reading and prayer and church attendance in the home, we only have one divorce out of every 300 marriages. But the national average is almost one out of every two, which indicates if you build it upon Christ, that's the answer to the breaking of the home today. Now, Christ was born in an earthly home and he lived under parental discipline. His first miracle was performed at a wedding ceremony. Christ's father died when he was young, apparently. There's no mention of him after he was 12 years of age, so maybe Jesus Christ, being the oldest son, was the breadwinner of the family, I don't know. But he knew all the problems of the home. And a favorite benediction of his was upon entering a home was, peace be upon this house. And Jesus said that the entry into the spiritual family is like the entry into a domestic family. It's through birth. He said, you must be born from above. You must be born again. Born into God's family. You were born into the present family in which you live or another family but you're born into God's family also. If you want to get to heaven, if you want to have your sins forgiven, if you want to know that you have eternal life, you must be born, born into God's family by repentance of faith and receiving, by repentance of your sins and receiving him by faith. Now, Jesus Christ advocated household salvation. To Zacchaeus, he said, this day is salvation come to your house. And whenever he saved or healed someone, his first concern was that they go home and tell their family about it. Some of them wanted to follow him from that day on. He said, no, go and tell your family. Go back and tell your community. Go tell others. To the restored demon-possessed man, his command was, return to your own house and show what great things God has done for you. And perhaps some of you are here tonight just embarking on your married life together. Maybe you're here on your honeymoon. And you could give one another no greater wedding gift than a young couple did the other night here at this stadium. They'd just been married, and the first thing they did was to come to this stadium and come forward and give their lives to Christ together. They said, we want to start our married life with Christ. That could happen to you tonight. Maybe you've been married 20 years or 30 years or 10 years, whatever, but you've never done that. Now, first, a successful home must be founded on a divinely ordered marriage. Remember, God performed the first marriage. Adam and Eve had an ideal marriage. Adam didn't have to hear about all the other men she could have married. And she didn't have to hear about the way his mother cooked. <laughs> if we disregard the God's suggestions and regulations for the home, it is in danger of ending in failure. But many people are reluctant to make a commitment. Physical love is not enough. It's commitment that carries over the difficult times. When you get married, you're committing for life. It's commitment that's kept Ruth and me together in times of stress or strain or difficulty. We wouldn't think of being separated or getting a divorce no matter what the problem was. Maybe she has. I never have. She once told someone she'd thought of murder but not divorce. Now, another cornerstone in the successful home and marriage is a spiritual exercise. Prayer, Bible reading, fellowship with other believers. In Deuteronomy 6 it says, and these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart and you shall teach them diligently unto your children. Do you say grace at the meal? Do you say prayer at the meal? Do you have prayer in the home? Do you and your wife ever read the Bible and pray together? 
And then thirdly, a successful home must be founded on a dedicated husband and father, as we've already said a moment ago. I heard about one clergyman before the children were born who wrote an article on the Ten Commandments for raising children. After he'd had the first child, he wrote an article and he changed the title and he said, Ten Suggestions, How to Rear Children. After the third child, he wrote ten hints on how to raise children. After the fifth child, he didn't write any more. Now, I used to be very authoritative about how to rear children until we had five. And I let my wife take over from there. And she did a terrific job, let me tell you. It's a big responsibility. When a man loves his wife as Christ loves the church, it's easy for the wife to submit to the husband. The image here is not of a mighty potentate sitting upon the throne and ruling his subjects with an iron hand. This is more like a conductor standing on his box directing a symphony, delicate but subdued. Is that the kind of a husband you are? The Bible says, live joyfully with the wife of thy youth. It doesn't say, go out and get you a younger woman. It says, live with the wife of your youth, the one you married when you were young. Be faithful. How many men, when they reach the age of 40 or 50 or 60, want to prove their virility and go out and get some young thing? That's not commitment. That is a sin against God. I read a newspaper story where it discussed several recent movies that deal with adultery as a positive growth experience. Don't you ever believe anything like that? That'll destroy our culture as quick as anything. The Bible says that unfaithfulness is the pathway to hell. And then fourthly, a successful home must have a devoted wife and mother. Napoleon said the greatest need of France was mothers. One of the vices which is hitting our wives and mothers today in the world is alcoholism and drugs. You see, they don't have Christ to turn to. And when you're rearing children, and when you're married, you need a resource. You need help. And that comes from God, a relationship to God. Just as the husband, to be the right kind of a husband, needs Christ, so to be the right kind of a wife or a mother, you need Christ. And so many don't have Christ, so they turn to something else to help them. A Christian home has a devoted mother and wife. Now, I know that in a place like Sheffield, where there's a, or Yorkshire, places in America like in Michigan, where there's great unemployment, women have to go to work. And I want to commend you for helping in the home and being willing to sacrifice by earning to help in the home during a time of depression or recession or lack of income in the home. And then fifthly, a successful home is based upon disciplined and obedient children. Now, children can absorb any amount of love and discipline as long as the two are kept in balance. I heard a psychiatrist say at Columbia University many years ago in the United States, he said, if your children rebel, keep their love at all costs. They'll come through it, and when they come through that period, the love will be there, and you won't have to reestablish anything. The scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go. Not the way he would go, but the way he should go. And we're to do it by setting an example of love and discipline together and in balance with each other. And when he's old, the scripture says, he'll not depart. He'll come back someday. Like the prodigal son, the father never gave up loving the son, and he came back. Your son, your daughter will come back. 
if you've trained them correctly when they were children and lived an example of Christ in front of them. But if you haven't lived an example in front of them, don't expect God to do great miracles. He might. He will, as I'll show you in just a moment, right here in Sheffield, what he's doing in some families right now. Your social and domestic responsibilities make your individual response to Christ that much more significant. On the other hand, if you're here with part or all of your family tonight, and the Lord says to you as he invited Noah, come thou and all thy house into the ark, the scripture says, come, husband and wife, come forward together. Father, son, come together. Daughter, mother, come together. Whoever you are, if you hear the still small voice of God within prompting you, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Come as a family or come alone. But don't leave here until you know Christ because you can't be the right kind of husband and father. You can't be the right kind of mother or wife or child in the home without Christ. And once you've heard the message as you've heard it tonight, your responsibility is so great because he says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. He that hardeneth his heart being often reproved shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. Here's a letter that says, Dear Dr. Graham, I had to write you to tell you this time last year my divorce papers were through. My husband was a minor on strike. My children's lives were in tatters because of my own sins. My young son was turning to crime at 13 years of age. My daughter was emotionally hurt, coping with my sins and unemployment after finishing college. For years, I'd been delving into the supernatural, reading cards of fortune and rapidly going to hell. I reached it when my marriage smashed and I thought it was my life to do what I wanted with. It was not always like that. We'd had a good marriage for 21 years. A bus with Billy Graham worth listening to kept passing my husband on the miners' picket line. It bugged him, tormented him, hounded him so much day after day that one dismal rainy night, he took me along to hear what this Billy Graham fella had to shout about. The divorce was almost through. My son was due in court. I went in anger thinking it was all so stupid. But Jesus cracked me that night. I broke my heart before him. I gave my life a year ago to one of the relays. She was in a relay. And I was born again. Three weeks ago, my husband was baptized. Saturday night, my daughter gave her life to Christ at Bramall Lane. My son didn't come, but gave over his life six months ago. This year, I'm a counselor, hoping to be God's servant. Dr. Graham, I know this will be thank you amongst thousands, but thank you for giving God's word last year on the brink of this family's near total destruction. This whole family is reunited in the love of God. It's not been easy. We have all had to hand things over to him. But oh my God, what he's given us in return. That's one family. And we have hundreds and scores of letters along similar lines from last year's mission and this year's mission here. What about you? I'm going to ask you to come tonight. You say, what do I have to do? I'm going to ask you to do what we've already seen thousands of people do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say, I'm a sinner. I need Christ. I want him to come into my life. I want him to come into my home. 
I'm ready to surrender and commit myself totally without reservation to him. But why do I ask people to come forward publicly? Because every person that Jesus called publicly, I called, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly like this that makes it real and genuine in your life. So I'm going to ask you to get up right now and come. If you come from that top stand up there, it's going to take two or three minutes. So start right now. And you along here and back here and all over this great stadium, you get up and come. We're going to wait on you and surrender your life to Christ. Maybe whole families will come. Maybe husbands and wives or sweethearts will come. Just get up and come. We're going to wait on you. Right now. Quickly. On your television screen, there's a number that you can call for spiritual health and counsel. People are standing by, ready to talk to you from the Word of God about the problem that you face, about the decision that you need to make. We want to help you. If the line is busy, just wait a few moments and call again. Make that call now. watching by television you can make your commitment just now as you see hundreds of people are coming here to make their commitment in Sheffield in South Yorkshire England you that are watching in America you can pick up a telephone and call that number that you see on the screen in Canada or the United States and their council is standing by to talk to you and if you get a busy signal call again they'll be there all evening and give your life to Christ. Maybe a whole family will give their life to Christ tonight on that telephone. We're going to pray for you as you make that commitment. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's Attic Bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free, so come walk this journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library.